Hi everyone. I use switching power supplies for all sorts of tasks, both store-bought and homemade ones, I have a lot of them. A while ago, I realized that I needed to make some low-power universal power supplies for all occasions, ones that could easily be adjusted to any reasonable output voltage and current. Ideally, it would be good to have several types of power supplies in different sizes. In my free time, I'm usually busy designing these kinds of power supplies and all sorts of little modules that should always be on hand. Today, I want to show you the design of a simple switching power supply with a power output of 90 to 100 watts. It's built using just a single chip from the top switch family. The power supply is stabilized by output voltage, has overheat protection, short circuit protection, feedback line brake protection, and electronic soft start. All of this is built into the chip itself. This project is made on excellent factory printed circuit boards, which, as always, were ordered from JLCPCB. Ordering the same or any other printed circuit boards for your projects, from simple single-sided to the most complex multi-layer boards, is quite easy. All you need to do is go to the JLC company website, upload your project archive with Gerber files, select the necessary options, and pay for your order. There are many options available for solder mask colors, PCB thickness, and trace coatings. The company can also manufacture boards on a fast-track basis within 24 hours. Thanks to a well-established technological process and a complete production cycle, JLC carefully controls every stage of manufacturing, so your boards will always be of outstanding quality. The prices are the most affordable. Boards from 1 to 8 layers start at just $2. There is also a $30 coupon available for 6-layer printed circuit boards. JLC PCB is easy to use, affordable to produce, and reliable in operation. You can find the link to the JLC company website in the description. The versatility of the power supply lies in the fact that top switch microchips are simple by nature and have the same circuit configuration. If you need a more powerful power supply, you simply install a more powerful microchip and other power components, and the output voltage is set by a divider in the control circuit of the TL431 reference voltage source. So, it's all pretty simple. All in all, I've been working with these microchips for a long time. And I really like them because of their simplicity. The 2220 package, just three pins, like a transistor. The external circuitry is minimal. Inside the chip, everything needed for its operation is already there, including a powerful output switch. These chips are designed for single-ended flyback converters. The most powerful one from the 220 series that I've worked with is the top 227. If you want, you can build power supplies up to 150 watts based on it, which is pretty good. As for high voltage components, there are just the basics, input circuits with a fuse, filter, rectifier, and smoothing capacitor, plus the chip itself with a couple of components in the external circuitry. Since this is a flyback converter, there is a reverse spike and self-induction from the transformer. The amplitude of these spikes can significantly exceed the supply voltage, which is dangerous for the chip. To suppress the reflected voltage, snubber circuits are used. In this unit, a standard circuit with a diode and a TBS diode was originally provided. But I went a bit overboard with the transformer's primary winding, and it turned out that at high power, over 60 watts, the TVS diode would fail after a few minutes of operation. As a result, a classic RCD clamp was used. Of course, the resistor in the circuit also heats up, but it works reliably. The resistor needs to be kept away from other components and should not be pressed against the board. I also slightly modified the boards from the archive. Mains filter. Its purpose is to protect the power grid from interference generated by the power supply. The thermistor limits the initial charging current of the large capacitor at the moment the power supply is switched on. On the secondary side, we have a rectifier in the form of a dual diode assembly with a common cathode, capacitors, and a reference voltage source, which essentially sets the output voltage of the power supply. There is a feedback line, which is based on an optical coupler. With its help, the reference source communicates with the top switch chip. There is also a small indicator showing the presence of output voltage. The chip operates at a frequency of about 100 kHz, and it's important to remember this. I'll explain why a bit later. Inside, it has a power and channel MOSFET transistor rated for 700 volts, with an average on-state resistance of about 2.5 ohms. All of this is necessary for calculating the power transformer. Now, about the transformer. Actually, it's not exactly a transformer, because in this topology it works as a choke, so it's more accurate to call it a multi-winding inductor. The operation of a flyback converter is simple, 
When the power switch is on, all the current flows through the primary winding of the transformer, and energy is stored as a magnetic flux. At this time, the diode is closed. When the transistor turns off, the current in the windings is interrupted, but the magnetic field can't disappear instantly, it collapses, inducing a voltage in the windings. However, this voltage has the opposite polarity. The magnetic energy stored in the core is converted into electrical energy, and an EMF appears in the windings. Moreover, this is a back EMF of self-induction, meaning its direction is reversed. This surge easily passes through the diode, accumulating in the output capacitors and powering the load. During the intervals when the transistor is open, the load is powered by the energy stored in the capacitors. In short, the operation of a flyback converter is based on the phenomenon of self-induction. For this reason, it's especially important here to observe the winding start points of all coils, which are indicated by dots both on the schematic and on the board. The transformer, which also serves as a choke, is a ferrite E-shaped magnetic core with a non-magnetic gap between the central legs. In my case, the gap is 0.6 mm. The transformer's parameters will depend on the chosen core and are calculated using software and applications. Knowing the initial data, the dimensions and type of the core, the gap, the parameters of the transistor inside the microchip, the maximum drain source voltage, the channel resistance, and the operating frequency of the converter, you can easily calculate the transformer. The winding operates at a rather high frequency, which means it's worth considering how to minimize the effects of skin effect. The thing is, at high frequencies, electricity doesn't flow evenly throughout the entire cross-section of the conductor, but mainly along its surface. That's why it's important to increase the surface area of the conductor. There are two main ways to do this. The first option is to wind with copper tape, but that's not always convenient or practical. And the second option is to use Litz wire for the winding. Litz wire is made up of a large number of parallel wires of the same diameter. The key point is that these aren't just regular wires, but enamel-coated wires. That is, each strand has its own lacquer insulation. As a result, the total surface area of Litz wire is much greater than that of a regular round wire of the same cross-section. The thinner the strands and the greater their number, the better. Important! If the core is used, it's best to remove any traces of old glue and varnish. All windings must be wound in the same direction, for example, clockwise. In my case, making sure to start the winding correctly, the first half of the primary winding was wound turn by turn onto the bare bobbin. Next, bring the end of the wire out of the bobbin, add insulation between the layers, about 5 or 6 layers, and then wind the entire secondary winding. On top of this winding, add insulation and wind the remaining half of the primary winding. Then, connect the start of the second half of the primary winding to the end of the first half of the same winding. This wire isn't used in the circuit, so just insulate it and forget about it. Next, add a couple of layers of insulation on top and wind the feedback winding, just a couple of turns. That's it for the winding. Then add another two or three layers of insulation and assemble the transformer, securely fastening the core halves together, for example, with captain tape. You can also glue them together for extra security. Next, clean the lacquer off the ends, shape the leads, and solder the transformer onto the board. The output choke is wound on a toroidal core made of powdered iron, with an inductance of about 3.5 to 4 microhenries. The winding wire diameter is between 0.85 and 1 millimeter. After assembling the power supply, carefully check the wiring. Next, clean the board and start testing. Here, I want to point out that I have a lot of chips from the TOP Switch series, and for testing, I always use the weaker and cheaper ones first. In this case, for testing, I put in a 224. The first startup of the power supply must always be done through a safety incandescent lamp, 40 or 60 watts, which is connected in series with one of the mains wires or in place of the fuse. After powering on, check the output voltage of the power supply. In my case, it's 12 volts. Leave the unit in this state for a few minutes. During this time, you can check the temperature of the diode and the chip. Just don't touch anything with your hands, there's high voltage in there and it's life-threatening. If everything is fine, disconnect the unit from the mains, remove the lamp, and attach the power components to the cooling heatsink. But not directly. Their bases need to be insulated from the heatsink. For this purpose, you can use mica pads or the more popular thermally conductive insulating pads and plastic bushings. At this stage, the chip has already been replaced with a top 227. Everything is ready for the final tests. Connect the power supply to the mains, 220 volts or 230, depending on what you have, and load the output of the power supply. In my case, the load is electronic. First, we set it to 50 watts and see that there is no significant voltage drop. And that's good. 
Next, the load is about 90 watts. There are still no noticeable voltage drops. I won't risk loading it with more power than that, since I'm almost certain the chip I have isn't original, but I do need to check the short circuit protection. So, holding my breath, I short the output. Looks like it survived. The protection works properly. I won't be showing the output voltage ripple, since in this particular case, no measures have been taken to minimize it, because these units will mostly be used in chargers together with voltage regulators, and ripple isn't especially important for charging. Of course, you can always add more capacitors to the output, an external filter, and so on, which will sharply reduce the ripple. The power supply is finished and works great, so it's time to wrap things up. You'll find a link to download the full project archive, as well as the project page, in the description. There you'll find the PCB, schematic, and other details. Don't forget to rate this video with a like or dislike, and share it with your friends on social media. That kind of support is truly invaluable. And with that, I'll say goodbye. As always, this was Kazinov K. See you next time. Bye.